Profanity Nation. Profanity Nation. Profanity Nation. Yeah, it's the new era of man for some old school fans with a new school brand. We got money on the mic with the plan in hand. And Stat Pat to his left, they go hand in hand. And to the right, we got Simster. He putting it down. It's the Profanity Nation. We running the town. Yeah. It's the Profanity Nation. Profanity Nation. Hey, welcome to the show. Welcome to the Profanity Nation podcast, where we are the voice of the professional fan. I've got my co-host here, Money Mike. How you feeling, my man? Man, I'm good. You know, it's a good old Sunday. Ready to go. Ready to go. I'm excited. Yeah, we've got a great guest tonight. Yeah, uh, yeah. We have a great guest tonight. We have the NBA player, coach, college coach, Terry Porter with us. Without it further ado, uh, let's just go ahead and bring him in right away. Uh, Terry Porter, please. Hey, Terry, how you doing? <laughs> Hey guys, how you doing? Good night. Good evening. I mean, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Thanks for hey, joining Terry. us. We really appreciate it. Uh, as I stated, uh, I'm Simsta. This is Money Mike, and uh, we really appreciate having you on the show. Um, in general, we're a show that uh, you know showcases, discusses NBA basketball, some other sports, and so forth. Well, it looks like you guys discuss more Laker basketball than NBA basketball. Uh, well, we, we yeah, are, <laughs> we are a little bit Lakers focused. Yeah, we are in LA, that's for sure. So, so this should make for a, a nice discussion. Yeah, uh, I, I have to. I have to admit, man, I I really did not like Portland back when it was playing because okay. it always seemed like Portland. Yeah. Always had the Lakers number. It didn't even matter if you were winning championships or not. They were always were tough games. And okay, man. You, you got to root, root for the home team. I, I understand that. You're supposed to okay. do that. Yeah, yeah. But, that. but it, it was always like it was always going to be a battle with Portland every time. So. Yeah, uh, that's uh, great battle. I always respected your game. You and Clyde Dressler and company. Man, you Thank guys you. always was tough, man. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, Terry, you spent, I believe, 17 years in the NBA, two all-star appearances. Uh, then you began your coaching career at Milwaukee, Phoenix, a small stint in Minnesota to take over for Rick Adelman, I believe, um, mm-hmm. and then uh, moved on to the college ranks. Uh, we'd love to talk to you. Let's start with the coaching, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, what, what would you say are some of the major differences between coaching in the NBA versus coaching in the college ranks? Well, I mean – at the, at the time where I coached the uh, pro ranks, I mean, there were, there were, um, there wasn't many young kids that there are, um, in the pro ranks now, there are more veterans, um, guys who've spent more years in, in college. The biggest challenge between the two of them really is just, um, having experience, um, kids that are playing at the professional level. It's kind of a career now. You got them locked into trying to do everything they want to do to, maintain a certain level they're in the league but they got to stay in the league so they got to make sure they continue to work every day in their preparation making sure they still work on their skill set and then at the college level you know they got a lot more stuff on their plate right at 18 19 years old they got academics they got social life they got obviously weights and study halls so there's a lot more things they got to navigate than you do at at the pro level from a coaching perspective the the most challenging part at times is both of them requires a lot of teaching right they require teaching and uh, educating at both ends in regards to your schemes and what you want to try to get accomplished so um the kids the professionals can pick up on different schemes because they've been around the game and they know different schemes it's just the verbiage is different the terminology is different well you get a high schooler at the college level who may not play not played any man-to-man or may play you know, just a certain type of man or not mostly play zone. So there's a lot more teaching at the collegiate level and you don't have the luxury of using as much film as you do at the pro level. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, being that, that you were obviously a player and a coach, um, do you feel that there's a difference, uh, maybe respect level for coaches that were players versus coaches that weren't? Um, uh, and that, that could go for the NBA and or in college. Well, I can speak if I put my player hat on. Yeah, I would say for me, if I was a player and I had a coach that played the game and had some of the accolades, I was able to just, you know, play college for four years, then went on to play professionally. I would definitely look at him in a different light. I would definitely listen to what he has to say in regards to his teaching because he's walked that walk. Right. He's been down there. He's probably done and seen everything that I have faced up to that point of my young career especially at the college level. I mean, obviously, 
um, a college level, they all dream about trying to just get an opportunity to make a roster in the NBA or at least have a chance to make it. Um, at the pro level, I think it helps it helps even more at the pro level because then you can talk more about the skill set you need to continue to develop. Um, you can talk more about how to become, you know, a solid player off the court, how to manage sponsorships, how to build those type of relationships as well. So I think from that perspective, most players, I mean, if, if, if they had a choice, I would think, and this is just me personally, sure. I would prefer to have a, a, a coach that I played because, you know, it's, it's easier for me to, um, you know, have respect for him because he's done it already. Well, let me, let me ask you a little bit more about like the construction of the team. Mm -hmm. um, because like if you go into like a head coach and, at, at the pro level, the team is kind of like the team and they kind of have the contracts already there. And then obviously you can make trades and stuff, things like that. Mm -hmm. But when you are doing recruitment at, at a college level, you already have an offense that already or defense that you kind of already run. Do you like look for different styles of players like at the high school level that could you think that could contribute to uh, you know, your co the college level, or it's you just try a, to a fit in, or, right? Yeah, fit in like, hey, he'll be good for my system, or do you just try to go for the best player? Uh, uh, in, you know, I, I think you have to be very careful trying to go for the best player. If that player mm -hmm. doesn't fit into a coach's system at the at the college level, it really falls on the head coach and his staff for him to educate his staff and say, look, these are the type of kids I want. If I want a kid that's a two-way player, if I want a kid that's a great three-point shooter, so you have to understand what your roster looks like and have a good balance for that. At the pro level, it's the same thing as well. I mean, if you have – it's a little bit more at the professional level, you got to make sure you're on page with the GM, especially because you and the GM are doing all the trading, you're doing all the preparation for the draft picks. And so if the GM sees the game as a half-court game, when he looks from his suite and sees that – he wants that team to be playing half court and the head coach is more of an up tempo. Want to see guys going up and down. Um, that's going to be a conflict at some point. That's not going to make it because the coach is going to be talking skill sets that are more up tempo. And the GM wants to get guys that are more half court, more structure, more trying to, you know, just make passes. So you have to understand uh, what's the makeup of the roster. But you look at all the great coaches who won championships, they all have the ability. Pat Riley, you guys are obviously very familiar. He went from yeah, school yeah. time to the grind and bump or however you want to call the New yeah. York Knicks and to back to being a, a more physical team in Miami. I, I think so. I think coaches at the college level have a better chance to flip their roster. As the pro level, you have a more difficult time flipping rosters because – the contracts are the contracts, and they're very hard to move. Absolutely. Yeah, there's so much business side involved with it. It's not just the player side at that point. Uh, that's for sure. Uh, let's regress a little bit, if we could. Um, I believe you were born and raised, or at least born in the uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin area. Is that correct? That's correct. Born okay. and raised. Um, uh, what exactly got you started playing basketball, and uh, what kept you driven to make it all the way to the league? Well, two older brothers uh, who got us, who got us, who got me started in it. And, um, you know, we always had a neighborhood that grew up and played a lot of sports, football, basketball, being probably the two biggest sports that I was around uh, most of my childhood. Played, I actually played more football than I did basketball. Um, but my two other, my two older brothers, when they came back home, because they were away for, I kind of grew up as only child, but when they came back on weekends, they always took me away, took me with them to the boys and girls club for pickup games. Um, back then, it was I think it was just called the boys clubs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Took, took, took took me there to the gym, and uh, on the weekends, um, I got to uh, you know kind of be that that young guy who wait for the old man, or maybe to, maybe for the not to have enough old man, and they would, they would let me pick up and play in the game. And um, you know, I learned a lot about basketball from them. I mean, I think that's something where it's a mentoring process, you know, old man in the neighborhood kind of teaches the young guys about the game. Sure. And my brothers are pretty good players themselves. And uh, that's how I kind of learned and just continue to learn. I was kind of a late bloomer, you know, in high school. Um, there was no freshman 
high school, in my high school years, there was just sophomores, juniors, and seniors. So I played my freshman year on the Boys and Girls Club team. Then when I got to high school, um, I didn't think I could make the team. And I continued to play with the Boys and Girls Club team that I played with my ninth grade uh, year. And then my, my next year, my junior year, I tried out for the team, made it my junior and senior year. And, you know, I had a decent high school year. I wouldn't say I had anything that was, you know, unbelievable. I made our conference, um, didn't make all state. I made all state special mention with about 40 or 50 other guys and went to Stevens Point. You know, kids, Coach Bennett um, was out. Actually, a funny story. Coach Bennett, who was the head coach, I don't know if you you guys are, know who Coach Bennett is, Dick Bennett, who played, coached at uh, Stevens Point, excuse me, then he coached at Wisconsin, took the Badgers to the Final Four, then coached uh, yeah. Washington State. His son, Tony Bennett, who's now the head coach of Virginia. Yeah. Dick was at a game, recruited another kid on another team, and his wife is the one who pointed me out in regards to someone he should be recruiting. And so – um, after the game, he came up to me. Um, we talked a little bit, exchanged. He gave me his card. I went up for a visit. Um, you know, like what he said, like that he had a couple guys from the Milwaukee public school system that I know about or, or um, you know, knew about and went up to point. And um, the rest was pretty much history. My freshman year, I got – I'm bore you guys my story. But freshman year, I got 0. Oh, 0.00 boy. minutes. And then my sophomore, my sophomore year, I started. My junior year, I started. And my senior year, in those last three years, we were able to make it to our national championship, which was in Kansas City. Yeah. I'm curious. Um, your older brothers, when they would play, did they take it easy on you? Or or did they play rough? No. It was no, it was no easy. It was, See, I think that makes the difference. I think that makes a huge difference, having those older brothers that you had to play against, those bigger guys. Oh, no question. I mean, I think to have older brothers or if you had friends in the neighborhood that was older guys that kind of took you under their wing. No, they were not soft about it. That's the last thing they want to be known is kind of, you know, being soft towards you. So they no, they they beat me up. They beat me up all the time. <laughs> they, uh, used to take you know, it that, was part of, that was part of the learning process back then. You know, it was hey, kids today, although they're skilled, there's no blacktop. Kids don't grow up on a blacktop today. They grow yeah. up on wood floor. They, they don't know. They don't, they, don't, they, don't leave a game, they don't leave a, a, a playground game with their skin ripped off uh, off their, uh, their their body. So, no, it's it's, it's a totally different uh, mindset where kids are growing up and how they learn the game today compared to back then because we didn't have access to indoor gyms. There was no such thing as a workout guy. You had to wake up and get to the gym before the game started and get to the playgrounds and try to get up shots before the guys would show up. And then you would only be, you know, it's only, you know, one full court if you're lucky on the playgrounds back then in Wisconsin. And it was cold quite a bit. Of the yeah, year. it was cold. <laughs> it was cold by then. Yeah, we didn't, cold. we didn't go. We didn't. Although I had a few moments where they they literally took down those baskets at, in the winter and put down ice and people skated on it. So oh, gee. You, could, you didn't have the, we didn't have the luxury like kids that maybe been in Indiana that had them stuck on their garages and stuff like that and just shoveled off the snow and just shot baskets on the garage driveway. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, you know what, though? Those are the errors for me that I really can't appreciate because, um, I mean, you know, obviously, like, you came in, in the league in 85, and you had the benefit of kind of being there where it was, you know, there was hand-checking and there was a way more physicality than, than it is in later years, like in the 2000s, where – you yeah. wasn't able to, you know, kind of rough people up as much. I personally appreciate the uh, uh, not that I want anybody obviously to get hurt or things like that, but I loved more physical game. Wh wh which one do you uh, uh, prefer more? Like, well, I wouldn't. I, mean, I wouldn't trade health. my years. For, I wouldn't trade my years um, to be in today's league. Obviously, financially, it, it's a it's a huge difference. But I just think I was blessed to be in a time where I got some. Some of the old, old legends, Dr. J. I got some of Dr. J. I got some of Kareem. Then I got, obviously, Magic and Larry and Michael. And so, and then even, um, so I was I was fortunate to get um, an era of basketball and playing that, that 85 to 02 when I retired to see a lot of the greats. And um, the style of play changed a little bit, but um, 
It was, it was, you had, you know, NBA back then, we say NBA stand for no boys allowed. So, you know, (laughs) it was, it was, it was very physical. Uh, You know, we didn't have the luxury of uh, referees going to check out things on the video all the time. It had to be, you, it it is what it is. And so there weren't nearly as many technical fouls. No, no. there And there wasn't many, uh, you know, referees, although the referees back then, you know, you couldn't you couldn't talk to referees where you guys talk to referees. Now, there's a few guys that could get away with it. But referees back then, um, you know, they, they would they would kick a guy out and give you a tech and a heartbeat for just looking at him wrong. You know, they they're looking at him wrong. Guys now, they understand that the game has grown so much bigger now. It's global now that it's hard for them to kick out a star, you know, on a televised game. Yeah, and uh, so much you know, money involved like it was now. back in the day because of the money is just too big. Yeah, exactly. Um, you brought up errors and you know how the game changed a little bit while you were playing, but now it's it, it does feel like a different game, uh, far less physical. Um, you know, there's fouls called. Where you know, if if you grew up like we did watching yourself play and mm-hmm. and the magics and the break i mean you know there were hard fouls and that's all they were were hard fouls they weren't thrown out of a game you, you didn't get a, a flagrant two with a yeah. fine um do you get a chance to watch a lot of basketball uh, nba these days and if so uh, what are your thoughts on how the game changed um i watch a lot of nba i watch a lot um i, I mean again every era is different and the rules the power of the b is the one who sets the rules and all of that like anything guys it's about the it's about the money, right? And I think yeah. that the rules have changed a lot because now owners, the, the compensation for these guys, if you have a if you have a, a player that you're getting two hundred million dollars, you don't want him to be thrown down to the floor. Think about some of those brawls and what happened. The the Kurt Rambis oh, yeah. clothesline. line. You imagine yeah. somebody yeah, yeah. getting two hundred million dollars and you're an owner and you see that player get clothesline like that and he has to be out and you still gotta pay him two hundred million dollars. So the rules have changed to protect the players more like it has in any, all these football, well. you could say football the same way. I mean, quarterbacks. Now you talk to so funny sometimes when you guys, I don't know if you guys have NFL guys on there, but yeah. the old NFL guys say you can't even touch a quarterback. Now it's, it's not even a, that's not really football, which is like flag football when it comes to, and it's only one position. So I, I think the game um, today is, it's a little bit more challenging to try to get, there's playoffs and there's regular season than playoffs. And so I would say this last playoff year, it was more physical than it's been in a, in a long time. And it was great. It was, I enjoyed it. I loved it. I loved it. So again, I think like anything, I don't know if the TV executives enjoyed it as much, but I enjoyed it because it just brought back a lot of memories about the, the fight that you got to have and a commitment. Each guy's got to be willing to sacrifice for the better of the team and, now it was teams. That was teams back then. I'm sure the Lakers had that. There was no, playoffs. There was a no no layup rule. Oh, absolutely. Right. You yeah. did not give up layups in the playoffs. If you did, you would get fined. Like you know, you had this. Like you get fined in the locker room. You just that was not. You know, obviously, if you had, if you didn't have, if you wasn't in foul trouble, you were supposed to take that foul and not let him finish with an and one. And um, you know, now it's it's going to the monitor. The, Make sure it's a flagrant one, a flagrant two. It's just yeah. it's taking some of that edge away from the game, I think, that fans appreciate. And I'm not saying during the regular season, but I think during the playoffs, there's a different mindset. And you have to have a tougher mentality, I think, because that's what it's all about. That's where it's all about. And that's where you earn your rep, your respect from the player, from your peers, from the audience, from the fans, because um, everybody expected to be tougher. You, you, I, I can tell you, I have to tell you, Terry, what, what I hate about today's game is that everybody loves everybody. Right. Like, I, <laughs> at the I, end I of can't, the game. At, at the, opposing teams, opposing like, players. Like, you know, everybody's cool, you know, in, in, in the summer they're hanging out in yachts and doing stuff like that. Like, back in your day, like, we li- we legitimately did not like anybody from Portland because you guys were yeah. a rival, right? You yeah. know, obviously, you know we didn't like the Celtics, you know, like yeah, and, yeah. and we hated them, and we yeah. did not, and and nobody, in the, but the players, you know, <laughs> felt that way too. Like they, you legitimately did not like the people. You didn't hang out with them, and to me, that's to me, that's what made competition better in yeah. in, in, in a sense because 
it, it, it was it was more like bragging rights. We about to go on the court, and I'm about to, you know, I will whoop your ass because I don't yeah. like you, and I'm not gonna let you do anything. Now it, it it's, mm-hmm. it's 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 hey, good, good game, man. Let's go out to the club, and you know, I, I don't know, you know. <laughs> well, you know what you know what it all stems from. Unfortunately, it's AAU basketball. Yeah, mm-hmm. the elite of these guys they they've been they've been seeing each other since they've been thirteen or twelve. I never, I never met anybody. I mean, I didn't, I didn't go to a school where, or even a conference where they produced a lot of NBA guys. So that's one thing. But even back then, you just didn't have the interaction with players at a younger age. I mean, that's why. Again, it's been well documented and talked about. Why today's guys all of a sudden want to go play with another guy, and another guy? Right. I mean, because they play with each other at an AAU event or together, um, and they want, they liked it, and now at the pro level, they want to do it. Magic never wanted to play with Bird. Bird never wanted to play with Magic. I mean, you talk about rivalries. None of these guys wanted to go play with a rivalry in their in their conference. That, that was a, unheard of. Like, no, we ain't doing that. We, we they didn't want to trade in the I same know. conference. Even, no, even no they, wouldn't, they, would be, they wouldn't even think about doing that. No, even front offices, like like Money Mike says, they if you got if you were traded. Even in the, as as late as the '80s, maybe early '90s, you were traded out of conference, so they would only see you one game, two games a year, and if at all in the finals, that's it. You yeah. didn't get a chance or a say of where you went. Obviously, the power in the league has changed. It's it, everyone calls it a players' league now, and uh, you know that that's changed the game. You know, to the to the youngsters that are watching now, they don't know any different. Um, but but to some of us who grew up watching again the 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 Jordans, the Birds, the the Magics, the uh, Drexlers, the the Porters, um, we really respected that grind and that hard work, and uh, it, you know it made a difference. It made a difference in the competitive nature of the games. At least we feel like it did. Yeah, I mean, I think if you don't if if you don't have interaction with somebody, and all of a sudden you you line up next to them. You're not thinking y'all friends. You know, you've never asked him what his mother's like or what's his sister, family, or just talked about how he grew up. You don't know anything about him. All you know is he's trying to come at you. He's trying to embarrass you. So you know what you, you have a different chip on your shoulder, how you go about trying to attack him. And when you have a relationship with somebody, you've known them from, you know, since they've been 13 and you've seen them at the Chris Paul's camps or the LeBron camps and, yep. you know, Jordan, all McDonald's. So you've seen them. At all these different events, then you've had a chance to hang out with them. That's off the court. Well, like you said, the many all stars back in the day, or many the uh, super super mega stars, never interact. Maybe besides all star game, exactly. You know? And that was about it. They didn't do anything. And at college, maybe a little bit when you went, maybe you had college teams and you played on those. But those were you know, in between like two years, every two years or four years. And so now kids, every summer, every summer kids are playing with each other, hanging out with each other. So when they get to the league, they want to play with each other. They would never done that back in our day. Yeah, but that's what I said. Like, you know, we know that Isaiah and Magic were great friends, but they wanted to beat each other on the court. You know what I mean? Like that's, and, and you know, yeah, I, that's, I, I still think that they should have, more of a competitive edge, you know, and because I always, um, my biggest complaint about like LeBron, for example, that he wanted to bring everybody around him, you know, to play with them, to kind of make things easier mm-hmm. versus actually beating their, you know, beating their butt, you know, like that, that should be the joy in, in that versus trying to team up to, you well, know, it's just a different mindset, you know, guys back in the day, Magic's of the world, Jordan's of the world, uh, Birds and Jordan's of the world, they, they wouldn't even think about asking for a trade. They, they're they going to put the pressure on the ownership and the GM. Go give me some players. Go give me some players that I feel that we can win a championship with. They're not going to look to hop around and go Or definitely else. not join forces with each other to create a super team. Yeah. I mean, again, that's, that's, that's part of what teams, what guys do now. Super okay. teams are just, I mean – there were super teams back then, but it was because, you know, most of the time because guys didn't want to leave, right? And they did draft picks. I mean, nowadays, super day, super teams are pretty much put together by free agency. Yeah. yeah. There's a few There's a few trades back then. You think of the great Celtic teams and the Laker teams that had, you know, on average four Hall of Fame guys. 
then you start looking at how those teams were built. They're all by trades or draft picks. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't really, you know, free agent. Oh, let's go there. There was some, but most of them was by trades or, or draft picks. How those teams were built. Um, you know, Lakers teams. Obviously, Kareem was tr traded. Uh, he was a trade, but Worthy was a draft pick. Obviously, Magic was a draft pick. Uh, Coop was a draft pick. I mean, the Portland team that I was a part of, the championship caliber team that I was a part of, I was a draft pick. Clyde was a draft pick. Jerome was a draft pick. Duckworth was a draft pick. Yeah. Uh, Buck was a – no, excuse me. Duck was a trade for Walter Berry. Uh, Buck Williams was a trade for Sam Bowie. So it's just – it's just different. It's just the mindset's different, and there's there's more teams in the league now. There's 30 teams in the league compared to when I was in. There's 24. The rosters are bigger. I think the rosters then was 12. Now they're 15. Mm -hmm. So um, you just got a lot more players in the league. Um, and the you know the D League used to be a league you could go get some guys that could fill a gap that could actually come in the game in a stretch where you had somebody lose somebody who could produce and, and score. So. Most guys now, most rosters now are, you know, pretty deep. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it's a different game. It, it felt like back in the day, uh, you brought up the, the Kurt Rambis, uh, the McHale clothesline and so forth. Mm -hmm. It really felt like back in the day there, there were certain players that were almost designated as enforcers um, that would go out and, and take that, you know, give that hard foul in retaliation if – their star was uh, hit with a hard foul. Is is that are are we correct in that assumption, or or it just appeared that way? That was called the power forwards. That's that position yeah, was called was the position. power forwards. With <laughs> and the power forward set screens, took hard fouls, and made sure that no one messed with the all star. That's what Maurice Lucas of the world enforcer. Yeah. He was nicknamed the enforcer. So mm -hmm. you know, like you said, there are a lot of guys like that. Back then, I mean, Charles Oakley, those guys, yep. even during that time, those guys, that's what their role was. That was a skill set back then. Yeah. Teams were made just like, I'm not a big hockey guy, but hockey guys, they always had that guy who you knew was going to get in a fight. And he was there to protect the stars. When someone got a hard foul on their star, the power forward was going to be the guy, when the ball came down to the other end, that he was going to take that foul on that, on their, the other opposing uh, all star. And so, now you go from power forward to what they call they call that guy position now stretch four. <laughs> exactly. He, he doesn't yeah, he doesn't have to get to the paint. He just floats around outside 23 feet. So, you know, it, it's it's totally different. I mean, it, it games has changed like anything, but guys with more point guard, shooting guard, small forward, power forward, center. Now it's uh he's He's a versatile player, multiple player. He can do yeah, almost positionless. Two, two, three like position. He's positionless. That's that's yeah. that's kind of the new term now, where um, you know you don't even find true centers. I guess you could say true. When I say true center, I mean centers that you know. I came in the league. True centers had to touch the ball fifteen or twenty times and the post. Right. And well, the they post. actually they I they. Don't they, they any, I don't know if there's anybody who touches the ball in the post that much. And our our offense, a lot of times, we couldn't take a perimeter shot until the ball touched the post. And came back out. And came back out. Inside out. Inside out basketball. That's how it was run. That's, that's how it was, it, was, it, was, it was played back then. Obviously, you tried to have turnovers and try to get in open court. But once the team scored and you had to take the ball at the net, that ball was going to touch the post. You coming down, that ball was going to touch the post somehow. And then if he got double team, he could kick it out. Then you can look for a shot or you can penetrate off that. But it wasn't going to be, you know, coming down, just launch it, launch it from 23 feet without even having ball reverse or not even having any type of movement. Absolutely. Now, uh, everyone's aware. I mean, it's well documented, the rivalry between the Lakers and the Celtics, of course. Mm -hmm. Um who would you just personally, who would you have considered uh, your rival team and who would you considered uh, maybe your most rivaled or, or difficult player to play against in your era? Well, uh, Portland, why are we for us was the Lakers at, at yeah. the time. Uh, definitely was the Lakers. Your first triple double was against the Lakers as well. Oh, I didn't know that. That's good to know. I didn't know <laughs> that. The Lakers were, the Lakers, I mean, it was the Lakers for us. And Phoenix Suns. Those are the two teams. Oh yeah, that we looked at. 
Danny Ainge. Um, then Danny later Ainge. San Antonio. But I, I would say on the on those runs we had, we always talked about beating the Lakers and uh, the Phoenix Suns were the two teams that kind of stood out. Utah a little bit later when they got big, they got good with Carl and, and Stockton, but um, it was always uh, for us the Lakers. But the Lakers was a standard back then. I mean, that was it in the West. I mean, at that time, there wasn't many teams that even can say they won championships. I think Houston maybe, um, you know, during that time. Um, but the Lakers were the golden standard in the West, and Boston was the golden standard in the East. And you always – you know, teams knew they had to kind of – if both of those teams were healthy and things were going well, you would have to go through them in order to make it to the finals. Yeah, when, when you say – because I, when I – you know, I grew up watching, you know, you know Mad Magic and, you know, that era that you were drafted in. And now the, nowadays these kids here, they kind of just disrespect that era. Uh, talk about their – they call – you know, like your era that they played against plumbers and not real basketball players, but then and, and like they had other jobs and things like that. And and to me, that doesn't make any sense because we got these these players like LeBron James trying to break records of your era. So, Michael, if, if if they're trying to break records of your era, you know, the assist records, triple double records, all this, all these records that were made there, and you know. How can they? How can they even people put in? I'm just asking your opinion about this. Yeah. Uh, the the fact that a hey, there were, there were nobody that they were playing against. I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, you know, the Carl Malone, the Michael Jordans, the put you the, know, put the Clyde rules Dressler, back to how the, they were. Put right, the rules back know, and see how these kids. Fare. Yeah, like, <laughs> you know, I mean, well, I, I think I think the kids now are coming in the league a lot earlier, and so the style of play, um, you know, it was just. Even the international kids, there was no international guys coming to the NBA back then because, again, there was, they didn't want to come because of the physicality. And um, that's that's what kind of held them back. I think today it's, it's probably more about skill. Obviously, the physicality is not there as well. I think the guys today are much better athletes. They may be bigger and stronger, but I don't know if they're – they have more uh, appreciation for the game overall collectively. There are some guys that I think really love the game and um, really study the history of the game. But overall, I think we were better complete players. We did more things, I think, at both ends of the floor than the current guys do. Um, that's just the, what the nature of the beast of the game now. Again, imagine all of a sudden teams taking, you know, 40 to 40, 50% of their shots, if there are 90 shots in a game, mm -hmm. they're, they're threes. Yep. I mean, I, yep. would, I would consider myself, just based on my percentage, one of the better three-point shooters in my era, and I only averaged two or three. I mean, nowadays, guy who shot my percentage, they're anywhere from seven to nine a game. Mm -hmm. They're seven to nine threes. So the, the makeup of the game is so totally different. Were, were there any players uh, that you really either looked forward to playing against um, or really hated playing against? Um, I always wanted to play against, the, you know, in the West, it was Tim Hardaway, Kevin Johnson, John Ooh. Stockton, uh, Magic. And then they, I, I got Magic early and then we switched Magic. We put Clyde on Magic because Clyde was, Magic was just posting me up at that point. So I, <laughs> I, I we did it. We, we did a good job after, hard. after a couple of those games. We just said, why am I guarding him? Because all he did is post me up and we would come double and he'd throw it out to Byron or somebody for a three. <laughs> so we switched and he didn't, you know, obviously he didn't try to post up Clyde Harley that much because his Clyde's size was obviously six, seven. And he was more physical and bigger than I was. So, uh, but no, I, I would say guys who played in my position during my era, especially in the, in the West, it was Tim Hardaway. It was Kevin Johnson. It was John Stockton, Magic. Um, Harper, who was part of the Dallas teams when they were really good. Mm -hmm. Those guys were just, you had, you had to be ready. You had to be ready. And um, in the East, you know, Isaiah was there, right? Yeah. Mark Price was there. Um, you know, guys like that, um, that was um, really good players and uh, guys that you, uh, you look forward to those matchups because you wanted to play against the best in your position. Uh. 
Portland's always been a tough team. They've always just kind of uh, stuck with the grind, um, even with the Rashid Wallaces, uh, so forth and so on. Remember those battles, of course, mm -hmm. uh, the historic uh, playoff battle against the Lakers, yep. uh, which helped uh, propel the Lakers to their uh, three-peat with Shaq and Kobe, mm -hmm. um, uh, so forth, the alley-oop. Um, you were born in Milwaukee, got a chance to coach there, but Portland has, has become your home. They've really embraced you, and, and that's kind of become your home, right? Um, um, what's that like? Yeah, I mean, obviously, um, you know, from 85 to 95, it's like anything, right? And I was a kid out of Stevens Point, Wisconsin, and the Trailblazers took a chance on me, and the city had adopted me and embraced me and just uh, embraced my family. Two of my kids were born here, and so it, it, it truly became home for me. Um, and, um, we had like anything, you have a lot of success and the city embrace you. And you think so much about the success you had in that particular city. Yes. I've gone on to play other places and coach other places, but when the time came for me to really sit down and say, okay, where do I want to have my family? Um, you know, we didn't want to go back to Wisconsin because the weather was so cold. We didn't want that. I had enough of those 18, I had 18, a good 20 years of my life of playing, you know, being in 20 degree, 20 below uh, degree weather. But no, I've always looked at Portland as a place that uh, I felt like it was it was home for me. It was part of my heart. Um, obviously, uh, Milwaukee's always that's where all my family's from. Uh, but Portland's been part of my extended family. I mean, I was blessed to have so much uh, success here as a professional athlete and the way the city um, really just embraced those teams and those years that we had. And uh, they've had, you know, for a small market team, they've had, they've done a great job of still trying to be relevant. I think year after year um, of being a team that's, playoff annually looking to go in the playoffs and has some chance to make a little noise here and there. And we had, we had a great three or four year stretch where it was one of the best stretches, not only just for our, our organization, but for the league in regards to, I think we averaged close to 60 wins a year and uh, made it to the finals two of those three years. And another time made it to the Western conference finals. So, and then they decided to, uh, you know, trade Clyde and that kind of shifted everything in regards to when that happened. Exactly. But you, you definitely uh, right now, Portland's got a incredibly loyal player, uh, incredible all star out there, Damian Lillard. Um, you know, he's been a baller, uh, just keeps balling, uh, shows up game after game. Um, what players today do you do you kind of like and and uh, maybe even tell your your um, your students or, or you know, the, the kids that you're coaching uh, that you would prefer they pattern their game after? Um. I mean, I think there's there's a lot of guys. Obviously, Damon Dame, I like a lot. Uh, I like what he how he competes every night. Um, the kids today are just so much. They're so skilled. Kevin Durant, I love. I mean, I love his skill. Um, you know, uh, on, uh, Greek freak. I love it, the way he plays. Um, I think there's a lot. The big guys, the way the big guys play. Um, Booker, I saw Booker play the other night. I love the way Booker plays. There's a there's a lot of guys in today's game. I think that are um, you know, I consider I, I would pay to go watch him play. LeBron, I always watch play. I, I think he's uh, one of the greatest players. That obviously, played the game. Uh, he's up there in the conversation. Um, the big guys, you know, I think that um, you know those guys. Um, Philly's guard, Philly's big guy. Um, Indeed, I think he's he's more versatile. I think the most bigs that I played with during the era. I mean, I. Trying to think of like a Brad Doherty type from Cleveland back in the day. Yeah. That, you know, he would, he would make the mid-range jumper, but he also had the ability to play uh, with his back and a little bit more mobile. He's not um, – but, no, there, there's um, – I'm sure I'm forgetting some of them, but there, there's a lot of guys that I appreciate. Uh, I appreciate guys that play uh, the, that are both ways. I mean, the Clipper guys, I think, I think both of those guys are worth seeing. Uh, they, they take the defensive end seriously, and they also – you know, know the importance of them uh, being productive at the offensive end. We, we touched a little bit, sorry, Rick. We, we touched a little bit on, um, you know, it's a player's league, super teams, players yep. joining up and so mm -hmm. forth. Um, now, it's very early in the 2022-2023 NBA season here. Uh, however, uh, the teams that, that, that 
perhaps you would call super teams that were players, you know, kind of joined forces. Uh, you brought one up in uh, the 76ers. That's Embiid and Harden. Yeah. Of course, we have the Nets, which is Durant, Kyrie, um, and uh, um, now Ben. Simmons. Uh, Simmons. And then you have uh, the Lakers, of course. And, um, you know, all three of those teams that I just brought up have started horrible this season. Um, they're not showing well at all. And, um, you know, Golden State, which kind of, you know, with the exception of the year that they got KD, they, they, they were formed a little bit more traditionally through draft and then mm -hmm. just adding a few players and they're very yeah. successful. Um, do you think that, that that's something, um, to, to take notice of, or is that just an exception to the rule nowadays? I think it's kind of an exception to the rule. I got lucky on just getting, I mean, no one thought Steph would be Steph. I mean, no one drafted exactly. Steph thinking he was going to be, I mean, he was a late pick and they got, you know, just like, you know, San Antonio, they, they got Ginobili and they got Tony Parker. No one expected those guys to be Hall of Fame players. They drafted them and they turned out to be pretty good players. I think today's game, it's, it's, um, you know, if you, if you, one of those elite teams, it's hard to, to get draft picks to pan out to be elite players or Hall of Fame players. And you have to hope because most of the time they have enough talent that they aren't going to be in the lottery. So they're going to be just outside the lottery. So they may get a player that may turn out to be at all pro, but he may not be to the level where he's a franchise type players. I mean, Golden State's got, you know, uh, two legitimate, I think, franchise type players. Uh, Draymond, is great. Draymond Green is great, but I think, he has to be in a system that's really good for around him, right? right. He's not really a great yeah. scorer. So if he, I mean, if he's playing for the Lakers right now, he he's not going to be that effective, right? It's not going. It's not, nothing's going to happen to make him be that great um, because he don't have the other pieces around him. Steph and Clay, you can put them on any roster, and they're going to be all uh, all star players and Cal Hall of Fame players. And so, I think um, in today's game, it's you you hope that you can get that franchise player like the Bucks got. I mean, he's a prime example. Giannis, they Absolutely. got him in the draft. Again, no one thought he was going to be the type of player he turned out to be. He turned out to reach high levels, and they went about trying to surround him with players. And that's another market that's hard to get, you know, free agents. Some, some of these cities, Portland's one of them, they've never in their history gotten any elite, as you could say, elite uh, free agents. They got some that – you would say kind of past their prime, but they never got the Shaqs of the world in their prime and Kareem's in the world in the prime. I mean, that just didn't happen. They didn't, they didn't happen. And it wasn't Golden State when they got KD in his prime. Um, players just, um, you know, they, there's a certain type of uh, city maybe that they want to go to or, um, and they just don't, um, you know, attract middle, middle uh, mid-sized San Antonio. As great as San Antonio, I mean, you could argue they're one of the greatest franchise dynasties ever they never really got big time but they were blessed to get them in the draft pick right they got david they got timmy they got ginobili they got tony parker so you know a a mid -market team, run with those players too yeah mid-market teams have to do it differently but, but let me let me ask you about that because um i mean like you said nobody knew uh curry was gonna be curry nobody knew um uh, you know uh Thompson was going to be Thompson mm -hmm. in the draft, right? Yeah. But they, somebody did. Those scouts that drafted them probably felt that way. I, I always have a thing like, something we got to stop drafting name brand players, and we actually have to really do our research and see if we could, if you have an eye for, like obviously, uh, uh, Jay West had an eye for Kobe Bryant. You know, to do that trade, you know, to make it with thirteen, mm -hmm. same type of thing. He had an eye for for these certain types of players, and he, you know, uh, because obviously the obvious are the obvious, right? You yeah. saw Tim Duncan in college. Oh, he's 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 number one, right? Yeah. But then there's also number ones like Bill and Beer for his, not Bill and Beer, uh, Leitner, Christian Leitner. You know, hey, you, you would have thought that he would have been a great Next Hall time. of Fame, you know, yeah, NBA player. player because of what he did in college but he never really panned out to wait in college so don't you have to give a lot of credit to the ones that have the eye to draft these players that people don't aren't necessarily where they're not on everybody's radar there's no question um 
I think that there's there's certain scouts and GMs who go beyond just seeing the guy on film, maybe because seeing the guy on film is one thing, but you gotta really know what that kid is made of. Is he a grinder? Is he a gym rat? Does he really want to be great? Mm -hmm. And you have to start talking to a high school coach. You know, back then it was a high school coach, and you talk to the you know maybe you know uh, you know his dad or his mom about his work ethic and what he does. You obviously talk about to the college his college coach. Um, but there's more, more opportunities today because you can see a kid at the AAU level. You can go to practices a lot more. You can really see the skill set and more so that you can also get a good feel of what kind of kid he is. Uh, does he, does he, does he love the game? Is he, does he love the game? And I think that's, I think Steph and Clay, both of those guys have always loved basketball, right? They stay in the gym and they had, they had a skill that in in that era, it's, it's a legitimate skill. Their ability to make perimeter shots was a huge factor. Um, and I think sometimes um, other guys, for whatever reason, maybe their team don't need that type of, uh, you know, skill at that time with that roster at the time. And they overlook guys because they, you know, prime example, Portland. And Portland and people always talk, go back to, well, why did you guys draft Sam Bowie? Well, they had, Jim Paxson, who's always an all-star, and had Clyde Drexler. Yep. What are they going to do with Michael Jordan, too? Yep, yep. I mean, no one – you're going to tell me no, no one knew Michael was going to be Michael. Exactly. Uh, and so <laughs> that's, no, that's no different. Um, no one – sometimes it's just hard to predict what guys are going to do based on what happens in college sometimes or how they're going to turn out at the pro level until they get to the pro level. And they're surrounded with pieces um, – that really give them a chance to blossom. But I, I think that um, great scouts are a plus and they separate themselves because they have a history. Jerry, you mentioned Jerry. Jerry's had a history of pointing, finding the right guys and finding that X factor that maybe somebody else didn't look into, didn't find out that Kobe, you know, from day one, he's like Tiger Woods from day one. He had Tiger had all Jack Nicholas records on this, on his wall. Kobe from day one, I think, to my understanding, all he cared about was being great like Michael Jordan. And he was determined to be that great. And so that was that's what separate guys, even at the early ages, where you may not be able to project and see what how great what how they're gonna become great, their work ethic and they're talking about how much they have a passion for the game separates them compared to the other guys. That's it. You know, we we've had uh we like to bring on uh, sports journalists and broadcasters uh, in here to uh, interview. And we really like to bring on some of the uh, more veteran broadcasters that were around. And we just had on uh, Ted Sobel, an L.A. Uh, sportscaster mm -hmm. here. And, you know, he's, he's uh, celebrating his 50th year with Laker credentials. So he's been around. When he got his first credential, Jerry West was still playing. And, and we wow. asked him that very question, uh, you know, what what would he say separates the – iconic players from the others. And he used the exact word you used passion said the passion to be great. Uh, so, so it does feel like, you know, exactly like you said, it's, it's, you have to have some talent. You have to be blessed with, you know, the ability, but uh, it's the passion that pushes you beyond the others. And uh, it would seem like that's, what's done it throughout uh, all time with NBA. I think that's the one thing that's very consistent. It doesn't matter what error. You find the best player in the era. He's you have anybody who played with him or anybody who competed against him, they're all gonna say he just had he had a different mindset of how he went about his work every day, how he was committed every day to get put in work, put in work, put in work. Um, you know, it's funny. Um, Allen Iverson, um, you know, I, I listen to him sometimes when he talked about his him and Kobe hanging out, and he's like, nah. Kobe, like, I'm going to the gym. Hey, I like, I'm going to the bar. I'll see you later. Right. Yep. I mean, different mindset, right? Yeah. I mean, I think anybody, I mean, the level that Kobe played, the level that anybody who was great, Bird, whoever you want to put in that category, Michael, you listen to guys who play with those guys and how they competed in practice. And more importantly, how they expected you to prepare yourself for the opportunity when you stepped on the floor. And it, it, they just expected everybody else around him to have a certain skill set and be willing to give everything they could because that's what they were doing. And they didn't want to be around guys that was not going to put 
in all the same amount of work and energy and effort and blood, sweat and tear because they wanted to reach greatness. And they only wanted people around them who was willing to have the same mindset. Absolutely. Um, I have a question. I'm going to circle back around uh, with this question here. Uh, being that you're a college coach, you know, uh, we talked about how the the game has changed and that's somewhat to protect the players. These are large investments and so forth. However, just the eye test as a fan who's been here tells me that there seems to be more injuries today than there ever were in the league. More players are out. More players are injured. More players are are missing seasons. Less players play 82 games. Um if that's correct, I don't have the numbers on this, but the eye test tells me this. What what might you say we could attribute that to, being that the the, the fouls aren't as hard and so forth, and a lot of these injuries are, um, uh, you know, they're not from other players. They're just they're just injuries from from a jump or a run or something along those mm -hmm. lines. Well, I mean, I have my own theory on that. My own theory is today's sports. Kids today at a very young age are told they only have to play, they only play one sport. Yep. I played all sports. I played football, I played basketball, I played some baseball. I wouldn't, I mean, we didn't, but we didn't play one sport year round. And I think at an early age, when your body's developing, you can't just continue to work the same muscles in it, you know, on and on throughout your whole life. And again, AAU is a huge factor. AAU, people don't realize kids at the high school level. In the summertime, if you, you know, when the regular high school year season's over, in the summertime, kids are playing on average because I had two boys that did it. Yep. They play four games a week. Yep. Yeah. They play back to back. On the same day, they play back to back and maybe even play a third game. Yep. If they're in a tournament. Absolutely. If they're in a tournament. That's a lot of grind on your body. That's a lot of wear and tear when your body's trying to mature. So you put that, and these guys start doing that at sixth grade. Yep. They start yep. doing that. Eleven you. And, Eleven you, you know, they don't get the, they don't get they don't take off this and go outside and play baseball or swim. No, they're doing that. They're going to workouts, they're doing all that. So it's a lot more concentrated now than it ever was. I think, no question about it. So you're overworking the same muscles. And then at the pro level, um, I don't know if it's management who decides this. And sometimes you hear guys talk about management, talk to guys about when they're going to rest, when they're going to sit them down. But in our era, that was like, man, when you play their two games, you got like, your peers look at you like, yo, man, you, you did something. You know, it, it, that's, 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 uh, that's just something that guys back then took a lot of pride in. I mean, yeah. even the league guys, you, league guys played hurt all the time. Guys now sometimes they get hurt. Like he's hurt. He's, he's sitting out because he had a little sprained ankle. It's not, it's like a two or three degree. And they just, they, they feel like, and I'm not trying to be the old guy who's always talking, but I think today oh, go guys, guys just, they have to be almost 100% before they come back during the regular season. Playoffs is different. Guys, when playoff comes, they're going to play if even they hurt. Yeah, I think during the regular season, and I think, again, management's the same way. I think management, they sit down with these guys and they tell them uh, four games and five nights. Now you're going to you're gonna take one of those nights out. Load management. That, load management. That was no, Matt, that was never talked about in our era. That wasn't that even was nothing talked about. <laughs> it wasn't coaches even. like coaches like low management. No, no, fuck low. This is my job. I'm you're gonna be playing. You're gonna be, you have to tell coach. You have to tell coaches, coaches. I can't play that many minutes. I can't. And it's just different now. Yeah, and 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 look, I agree. I think um, I love it back back in those days because they didn't have private jets and. <laughs> you know, and and, and but it made you harder, it, right? It, it, your skin yeah, like bit. you know, the they have to have you know they don't rest on the back to back, and you like there's so many more luxuries that these players have now, uh, along with the money, and they, it's like they have to do less. Uh, um, you know, it is, and I understand it's just the, it's the times, but I think it takes a little bit of the the heart, the desire mm -hmm. really to be great. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, don't, I, um, I think there's still a little of that doing, but even back in my time, remember, man, the veterans I had around me, I was their rook for a whole year. I would, I'd had no name. I, I had no, no, no name my rookie year. You had to do, you had to carry the balls in. You had to bring vets, you know, their shoes and do, th I don't know if guys are still doing that now, but the hazing, it, 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 the hazing part is part of the game as well. I think there's still some of that, maybe, but not to the level it was back then. 
but I, again, I mean, I don't know how time, everything changes. It's just, you know, it's just different. I mean, it's just different. There's a lot more, as you say, amenities provided to guys nowadays, the hotels, uh, everything is, is just because the way the game has been and David Stern had did a marvelous job of growing the game globally, that the money is just unbelievable now. I mean, it's just like anything. It's like anything you want to talk about cars. Well, back then the cars, you had a Mercedes, you're like, man, he, he's in the league. He's he's a he's a vet. <laughs> now it's like Rolls Royce or Bentleys. I mean, it's the car's different. I mean, hotels back then was like Marriotts. You thought, okay, we go. Now it's four seasons of Rich Carlton's. It's just right. absolutely. But that's but that's like anything. The owners are getting money too now. Don't act like the players. This is right. all based on collective bargaining because because of the money is coming in from all the different resources. They have to figure out how to how to share that money with the players, and it's if they can't constantly just give the players money, it has to be now you're talking about the amenities that they provided, like you said, the way they travel, the accommodations, you know, the food that's you know, and the practice facilities. We never had, we never had practice facilities at any of the places I grew up. We were we were in Jewish community centers, and then we were in high schools on the weekend, and that was. That was the norm for a lot of teams back then. And again, it's just like anything. You have different owners, different owners with different mindsets. Owners come in, there a lot more money back then. Uh, they didn't have owners that had unbelievable money. Like they had owners bought teams for like maybe 5 million or 10 million. Yeah. Now, you know, now they buy teams for billions, you know? Yeah. And so, you know, it's, it's so just um, like anything. So I'm gonna put you on the spot here because you 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 played in the '80s mm -hmm. and you also played you know the last couple of years in the 2000s. So mm -hmm. you kind of the 2000s you kind of got the luxury with the private plane and oh the no question by then yeah and, no and, question and, yeah and all that. Which one would you prefer? Would you prefer how you <laughs> started in the league, the grind, or the 2000 when you was out, leaving out the league? Which when I, when I was in two, I was like 38, 39. I want I want the <laughs> private plane. I don't want to have to be staying up all night and having to wake up at 4 a.m. to catch the very first flight and a yep. commercial flight. No, I back then I wanted, no, I wanted, I wanted to be, you know, have a game, be over with, get on the bus, get on the plane, and go and go to the go to the next city. I wasn't at that. I was married. I wasn't trying to get out. I was, <laughs> what I, you yes, you was on vacation. Me, feed me okay. and give me some rest and let me go. Let me go to the next game. That's what I was about. Okay, so let's say twenty five. You would you prefer the two thousands or the eighty five or the or the area you came in? Yeah, the twenty five. Been like yeah, because if I'm in L A or somewhere in Chicago, I want to be out. I want to get on no. Okay. I want to get on no flight and go to Utah. <laughs> all better. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's all better. It's all better in the two thousands. Huh? Yeah. I mean, it's who? I mean, at twenty, I didn't. I was twenty. I was like, I'm good. I, mean, I can go out to four or five in the morning. I'm gonna get up. And I'm gonna be ready the next day. Didn't matter. Yeah. Didn't matter. So, so he appreciate the, the two thousand. <laughs> Everyone appreciates. Yeah. I, mean, I think like anybody. I, I get it. As, as you get older you appreciate the way that the amenities are because you get a chance to rest more. Yeah. And as you get older, those nights where you have to, you get a chance to get on a bus, get on a plane, go to sleep, go to the next city, get in that bed as quickly as you can get in that bed and get some rest and uh, prep your body for the next day. That's good. That's, that's the reason. That's the <laughs> turnaround time. That turnaround time, when you get from 20 to 25, 28, your turnaround time is pretty good. You start getting 29, 30, 30, 30 no, that turnaround time is hard. That rest time, <laughs> yeah. that's hard, man. You ain't going to be able to just bounce up anymore like you used to do. Like, that's just, that's just different mindset. Father time is undefeated. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Terry, this has been absolutely great. Now, uh, uh, we're getting towards the end of the episode here. And, and every uh, episode, we end with a segment we call Money Mike's Out of Bounds. Okay. Mike's going to go ahead and share his thoughts or opinions on a topic. And it's really simple. He just wants to know are those thoughts or opinions inbounds or out of bounds? Money okay. Mike, not the mic. All right, Terry. So this was especially for you because I, I I love the era that you that you played in, all the eras. And I'm going back there. There's always a, a GOAT conversation. Uh, uh, you know, GOAT stands for greatest of all time. I know. Yeah. And, 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 and me personally, I've always had an issue with that because um, I think you have to incorporate 
like what we were just talking about, conditions, what we had to play through, what we're able to do now versus what we did like 20, 30 years ago, yep. whatever. Yep. Uh, I personally think that there should be a GOAT per era versus GOAT of of, of all, all time. time. For example, and I'll give an example, like because I, I always say, like, look, you guys, look at look how great Bill Russell was and what he did on the court, but he also had to fight racism. Right, you know, like he wasn't allowed to even be in places, you know, uh, in uh, his hometown. In, in his hometown, yeah. So, but he still was able to do what he did on the court, and he had to battle stuff that these players nowadays don't have to, don't don't have to uh, face. Yeah. And I think so much right now, uh, goat is about marketing. You know what I mean? The commercials, and you know what I mean, versus actually the goat. So, am I out of bounds to say that they should never have? A goat, and they, uh, and if they do, it should be based on error versus just one player completely. Uh, Mike, I would say you're inbounds. I would say that there should be an error goat because of all the things you mentioned. I think that each generation, with the style of play and the rules, and that changes generations. I mean, think think of a Shaq or a Keem, what would they do in today's, do you think they'd be as successful in today's game? They were back then. I would think they would have a hard time in today's game. Right. Mm -hmm. I just think they would. I mean, Will Chamberlain, those guys like that. I mean, I just think if you're a big, you would have a tough time. Even the guards today, I think they, they're great because they're allowed to do a lot more shooting. It's like quarterbacks in the NFL. You talk to older quarterbacks, well, of course these guys are breaking my records. They don't even run the ball 30 times anymore. All they do now is they throw the ball 50 yeah. and 60 times. So I would say you are inbounds when it comes to how media and how I think just the general public look at the word GOAT and GOATs of all sports. I mean, there's, there's certain GOATs that I think they, they're just like Tom Brady. He's a GOAT. I mean, he's just he is. Yeah, right. Jordan's a goat. I mean, he just he just is Muhammad Ali. He's a goat. I mean, yep. there's certain guys that that word is just there's no you don't need to say anything else. They they fit the prescription uh, without a doubt. And, but you know, I think everybody talks about basketball because it's just you know Michael, Kobe. Obviously, you know you talk. They, it seems awesome. they don't seem to mention centers when they talk about the goat for right. They never talk about Kareem, and uh, you know so it's always. And that, that's, what Michael says, Kobe. that's what everybody says. I said, if you, if, if, can you look at Kareem's stats? Look what he's done. Like, you know, not just in, in, in the professional, but, you know, high school and college. And, you know, like I said, I think it's so much more marketing than anything else. Uh, but I appreciate you for agreeing with me. Yeah. What do you think, what do you think Jeff? Oh, you're in bounds. You're completely you're in bounds. I think you're definitely in bounds. I think, I mean, I, that's a great way to frame it. I think if you framed it that way, you wouldn't have guys talk about, well, Jordan's better than Kobe or Jordan's better than LeBron. Because if you go by errors, Jordan's the best in his era. There's no question. There's right. no, you can't yeah. argue that. I mean, obviously, yeah. Michael and uh, Magic and, and Bird, you could say they're trying to argue, but there's no argument. Yep. I mean, and when you talk about the GOAT of the next era, is it Kobe? Is it Tim Duncan? Is it LeBron? Those guys who have – I mean, I think Tim has five right. championships. Kobe yeah. has four or five. I mean, they're yep. – I mean, there are – both of those players, to me, I hold a higher standard because they did it with one franchise. Right. And they made that franchise adjust to going out and getting great players for they can stay there. Um, and LeBron is, you know, his record is his record. But, I mean, at the end of the day, I'm not of that level. But you ask the guys who are that level of GOAT stature, it's about what you do in the biggest moments. Yes, he's been unbelievable. I've gone to – I mean, I couldn't imagine going to seven or eight NBA finals. Right. But you see, but look, I, I already got time, but he didn't win, so who cares? That's what I'm saying, but and that's what I'm saying. That's what, <laughs> you know, you like about, you know, I might be Russell with the nine, but he won nine. Yeah, but I mean, I think that's what separates him. And right or wrong, yeah. right or wrong, the Jordans of the world say, so "Yeah, he's great. He went to all of them, but he didn't win them." And right. if you that player, if you consider the goat, you're supposed to win them. Tom Brady, he went to ten of them, but he won seven of them. Right. Yeah. You know, so yeah. got to win more than half. That's that's the separation is. I tell everybody, I say, listen, my my daughter went to school, took a test, took it, and got five right. She she that's a fail. <laughs> five out of ten. Fail. You know, <laughs> five out of seven 10. out of ten. Okay, she passed, but five <laughs> out of ten, it's a fail. That's what it is. Okay, but you know, fifty percent only works if you're in baseball. 
Yeah, right, yeah. right, exactly. A 300 is great. Right. Terry, this has been outstanding. Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate you taking part in the Profanity Nation podcast. Um, I think you, you're, uh, of course, we, we touched base on LinkedIn. Are you on uh, Twitter or Instagram at all? I'm on, uh, I'm on the gram. I think I'm on, on Instagram, and I, I think it's, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not, I'm not pretty, crazy, right? but I'm, I'm, um, I'm trying to think what is my handle is at, uh, I think it's, I think it's T Porter 30. T Porter 30. Yeah. I believe it's right there. So, yeah. uh, Everybody, be sure to follow. Uh, keep up to date with what Terry's got going on. This That's is right. been get my get my num- get my numbers up. <laughs> get my numbers exactly, exactly, because that's what counts these days. We know that's that, right? Counts about all oh, how, how your numbers are. No, no, that's great. That's great. Hey, Terry. Hey. Uh, next time you're in the Los Angeles area, we'd love for you to swing by the studio, say hello. Uh, we definitely look forward to that one day. We look forward to seeing you again, seeing you on the coaching uh, on the sideline and uh, everything that you've got going on. Thank you so much for being with us, and we hope you have a great evening. Uh, thank you guys so much for having me. Enjoyed the conversation, too. You guys keep doing it. I love talking right. about sports. Love talking about basketball. It, it's it's a great sport. Absolutely. Appreciate you, man. Thank you very much. Can't Thanks, wait to talk Harry. to you again. Yeah. Peace. Have a good night. Thank Bye. you. Oh, that was wonderful. Yeah, it was. was it, it was. You know, talking to a legend and in that era, though, like I – I mean, I love. I think I love the night, the nineties era. Though. Oh yeah, like the the, yeah, the he Jordan played in the eighties. He went through yeah. that era. Like he, you said, he, he saw it go three. from from commercial flights to charter flights. He experienced right. that change. Yeah, um, and of course, he's gonna like you know the, yeah, yeah. the chartered flights. Who wouldn't? But um, but you gotta add though, because the grind is different. The work was different. It made a, the mentality made for was different. a tougher player, I believe. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. You know, you had to. But uh, this was outstanding, guys. Thank you so much for joining us for another amazing podcast, another amazing show of the Profanity Nation. Uh, of course, you know where to find it, right here on Infanity Studio streaming channel. Hit that subscribe button or you're going to miss future shows. We've got the waiver wire. We've got Monday Night Fredo. We've got a new show coming up called The Breaks. We've got The Art of Love. We've got so much for you to watch. You do not want to miss it. The Infinity Studio streaming channel, that's where you're going to find it. Subscribe now. Follow us on Instagram. Follow us on Twitter. Keep up to date with everything we've got going on. Uh, until next week, which we will be back next Sunday, 8.30 p.m. Pacific, like we are every week. Guys, take care. We'll see you then. Peace.